Hey, what do you think of these bulletins? Yeah, we found out all the cool kids were doing this, so we decided we'd go ahead and start doing bulletins as well. Now, we raised them from pre-pandemic times to uh, resurrect them again, so uh, take a look at those things. There are things you can fill out for uh, prayer requests and for uh, updating us about your address, email, and if you're a visitor and want to know more about the church, things to fill out there as well. Chock full of information, all right? Let's just open in prayer real quick. Father, we need to hear from you. We get so many messages from so many sources, day after day, week after week. But when we hear from you, things happen inside of us and around us. And it reminds us, Lord, that you're with us, that you know us, and you can, in a most particular way, guide us and help us. We're trusting that's going to happen today for us through this ministry of the word, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. On Monday morning, this showed up on what used to be known as Twitter, now known as X. We put that up there? Yeah, there it is. Of all people, Elmo reached out on X and posted this. Elmo's just checking in. How's everyone doing? And the dam broke wide open. There are 205 million views of this and thousands and thousands of replies. Not what they were expecting. Listen to some of them. Almost asking, How is there, I'm, how's everyone doing? Here are the replies. I'm at my lowest. But thanks for asking. The world is burning around us, Elmo. Elmo, we are tired. Wife left me. Daughters don't respect me. My job is a joke. Any more questions, Elmo? Elmo, I'm suffering from existential dread over here. The actor Rain Wilson plays Dwight on The Office. I'm kind of at a crossroads and frankly, could use a little support. Another one. Elmo, I'm depressed and broke. How about this one? Elmo, people have lost all hope in the dystopian nightmare that was once America. We're on the edge of a civil war, a world war, and a culture war. Elmo, I lost my job, had to sell my house. My health insurance premium is up 30%. My electric bill went up 300%. My grocery bill is up 500%. But I can recite my ABCs and count to seven in Spanish, so thanks for that. Elmo, no one is okay. We need Big Bird, bro. <laughs> Elmo, I'm broken, sick, and alone. Now, Sesame Workshop, which is behind the Elmo account, began replying with helplines and suicide prevention sites after all these replies started coming back. And just think of it, a kind, caring, empathetical, fictional character checks in and thousands reply with such anxiety and uncertainty and sadness. People are living in such hopelessness. And yet for so many, the good news of Jesus, nah, that's not my truth. But you know, by the way, this anxious pessimism I just described, church people, 
Church people aren't immune to this. It's showing up in a couple of ways among church folks. Some have become so wary and distrusting of any authority that they have no confidence in the church as the actual body of Christ and in the Bible as actually a clear and consistent source of truth. There's no trust there anymore. And then these real feels of troubles and unrest and fear, it deflates the faith that they once knew. And there's some new labels have emerged to describe such wandering folks. They are called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, meaning they have no particular church affiliation anymore. Or they've deconstructed their faith, which means they've taken it apart and then replaced it with nothing at all. Friends here at West Springs Church, guess what? This is nothing new. There has been trouble in the world and all of its attendant fallout since Adam tried to sew fig leaf boxers. <laughs> but there is a book in the Bible that in particular speaks to this. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews is addressing that trouble and fallout. And he's writing to people who are believers and believer adjacent. What do I mean by believer adjacent? By this I mean people who are intersecting with Christian truth and associating with Christian people, but still actually have not come to faith in Jesus. And on the surface, these two groups are almost indistinguishable. But over the next few weeks, we're going to let the God-breathed words of Hebrews clarify and fortify our faith in Jesus and inoculate us from this current level of anxiousness, pessimism, and a sense of immobility in life. Very brief introduction to the letter to the Hebrews. It isn't exactly like any other letter in the New Testament, is it? I mean, it sort of ends like other letters in the New Testament. You can look at the end of it and see that it sort of ends like those letters. But it starts out without any kind of greeting. And it doesn't address any particular church or group of people. And there's no mention anywhere in it of the author's name. Now, solid Biblical scholars conclude that the letter to the Hebrews was actually, initially, a sermon. A powerful and timely one from maybe one of the first leaders of the church, maybe even one of the twelve apostles. Because in Hebrews 2.3, he says that, the writer says that he heard the Lord Jesus announce the gospel. So he had to be one of the ones who was around Jesus when Jesus was actually ministering on earth. That's all we know. We don't know anything else about who wrote this. Anyway, this sermon was so timely and powerful in addressing the pressures coming against these early Christ followers that it went viral. And it was sent out as a letter to those who weren't able to hear it preached firsthand. When was it written? Well, it had to be written before 70 AD. Because in the letter he references the temple sacrifices as still going on. And we know the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, regularly appearing throughout this sermon are passages that in the most pastorally concerned way warn believers and believer adjacents warns them not to succumb to falling away or falling back from Jesus and the gospel. And there are about a half dozen of these passages. And over the next number of weeks, we will, well, 
let ourselves be warned and helped. Now the first warning passage is right in the beginning of the letter and it's broken into two parts separated by a passage that explains something about Jesus. But let's take a look at the warning itself. We find it in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Let's read it. I'll read it to you. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And then we move to chapter 2, verse 1. We must pay the most close, most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violent violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, as I mentioned before, in between these two passages I just read is this beautiful expl explanation why Jesus is superior to supernatural beings, in particular talking about angels. And why that passage is there is because one of the needs of these first followers of Jesus, they had to figure out how to understand what it meant that Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. And it raised questions like, fully God and fully man? Does that mean he was like maybe like an angel? And the writer here explains, no. He's greater than the angels. And then the writer moves back to his out-of-the-gate warning. And that's what we're looking at today. What's the warning? He's asking the Christians that are receiving this. Are you listening? And here's how he comes at it. The first thing that he lays down foundationally is this. God speaks. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, it's very clear that God speaks. He communicates to us so we can know him, we can know his will, we can know his love. And you think about it, back in Genesis, in creation, God spoke. He said, let there be light. He, every time a new aspect of creation happens, he speaks it into existence. Creation, God spoke. When Adam and Eve disobeyed and they fled from him, he spoke to them. Where are you? When he began to form his chosen people, he looked down into the world and he spoke to Abraham and called him to leave his home and follow him to a place he did not know. When he gave his law on Mount Sinai, he spoke to Moses. And when the people of God wandered from him in disobedience, he spoke to them through his prophets. In the Old Testament, we are told a number of times that God commanded that the words that he spoke be written down. All this to say that coming out of the gate, God does not reveal himself 
like he does in false religion. He doesn't reveal himself by mystical enlightenment or by a great discovery after seeking after him and finding him. God speaks clearly, and what he speaks, he preserves through his written word. Now, in our section that we just read in Hebrews, we're going to put a slide up here. Look how the writer of Hebrews emphasizes this in the opening section. Verse 1, God spoke. Verse 2, he has spoken. Chapter 2, verse 1, what we have heard. Chapter 2, verse 2, the message spoken. Chapter 2, verse 3, first announced to those who heard him. Chapter 2, verse 4, God testified. All these speaking words are being used here. God has spoken. This, I mean, we might just think, well, that, that, that's, that's not all that important, my friends. It is so crucial that we know that we have a God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. And notice in this passage, there's a progression of clarity in that communication. It starts out, it says in verse 1, in many times, in various ways, through the prophets. And then it says, but now, in these latter days, he's spoken to us by his son or through his son. You know, Jesus talked about that too. Jesus said to his followers in John 14, 4, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And here, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory. And get this, the exact representation of his being. Look at the privilege we have. We have God's word and we have God's son. I've never recommended that people start reading the Bible first off in Genesis. I never recommend that. Start from the beginning and read it through. I don't recommend that. You see, to get to best know God in his word, you start with the Gospels. You meet Jesus. You read what he's like, how he lives, how he loves, what he says. And if you do that, then the rest of God's word comes into a clear, sharp focus. You see, there is only one God. He eternally existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. And we get to see what God is like through the second person of the Trinity, God's Son, Jesus. And so the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, he's the same God and he's the same way. Holy, all-powerful, righteous, full of mercy, abounding in grace. And he comes at us with love and acceptance and forgiveness. And then the warning in chapter 2, verse 1, is said, Since God has spoken, we must pay the most careful attention. The challenge is this again. Are you listening? You see, because not listening, not heeding, not conforming to and obeying God's word, it has an inevitable and terrible result. Drifting away. That's what it says. So that you don't drift away. Humanity from the beginning has been beguiled by a ruthless, hate-filled enemy, beguiled to doubt and then reject God's word. 
Look in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is right at the beginning. There's creation. They're in the garden. And the enemy appears. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but, the, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree in the garden that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not, must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you see the tactic that's there? First of all, the enemy says, did God say he questions whether God has spoken at all. Secondly, you will certainly not die. If God has spoken, he hasn't spoken the truth to you. Or you didn't get it right. You didn't understand it. And then thirdly, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. He's saying... You can't trust God and what he says or you think he says because God is untrustworthy and oppressive. And here in 2024, these same lies are used to lure people into a Christ-denying resistance of the gospel and to affirm them in their sinful rejection of the Lord's love acceptance and forgiveness. We hear it all the time. The Bible is not the word of God. It cannot be trusted. And what it does say is false. And it's oftentimes used to promote evil things like patriarchy and oppression. That's still being said in 2024. And you think about it, why should the devil abandon a tactic that has worked for millennia. Now, there are right responses to all of those charges. One can demonstrate to a skeptic that the transmission of biblical texts over the centuries and the translations available do reliably give us what the original text said. We can say appropriate in interpretation and understanding of the Bible in its setting leads to no contradiction with proven science and history. And of course, we can show that the Bible neither teaches nor endorses anything unjust or unrighteous. We can say all those things, and we do. But in reality, those assertions rarely change the minds of those who scoff at God's word. You can't argue people out of that stuff. You know why? Something deeper and actually more fearful shapes a word of God rejecting heart. Look at Hebrews 2 verse 2. For since the message spoken through angels was binding. That's talking about, by the way, the law of God. They, uh, there are elements in the Old Testament that indicate that when Moses was receiving the law, it was, it was uh, there were angels present, so that's why it talks about spoken through angels. Since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience reserved its just punishment. You see, the Bible teaches God is holy, and sin is against him, and has consequential just punishments. And nobody wants to hear that. Certainly this was my pushback when I was an unbeliever. And I wasn't really all that aware of it at the time. But I know that I hated the thought 
of divine consequences. And I love much of my sin. So who wants to believe what the Bible says about those things? So that resistance to the word of God is deeply embedded in all of us in our fallen condition. So what changes the mind of those who resist the word of God? Hebrews 2 verse 4. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to to his will. Okay. Here's how this works. The word of God in some form or another is announced or proclaimed or shared. And then to the person that God is reaching things begin to happen. It talks about signs, right? God testified to it by signs. Signs, well, things occur in that person's life. And all of a sudden you get the sense that God is saying something to me. All of a sudden, circumstances begin to come together and it's like, wait a minute, what's happening in my life right now? And you get this sense Something's going on. There are signs pointing me away from the way I used to be and used to think to something or maybe someone else. Talks about wonders. That person sees wonders in creation, wonders in the world, wonders in various people, and, and we're struck by the goodness that we've been blind to, the variety and intricacy in the world around us, and there's this realization that begins to happen to us as we've been so self-focused, and maybe there's more to life than what I thought. Maybe. And then there's miracles. The greatest miracle in my life I was once blind and now I see. Right? You know what I'm talking about. I was completely oblivious to anything of reality, of faith in God. The gospel, Jesus, I, I, I couldn't see anything of that. I was completely blind to it. And then my eyes were opened and I saw it was there all the time, and I was totally and absolutely blind to it. And then the people that had been around me, who were in a similar condition that I had been in, they were still as blind. They, they, they could not get what was going on with McDonald. Wow, how could they? How could they? Weeks earlier, I wouldn't have been able to see it either. But what Jesus does to a lost and dying in this world sinner is an absolute miracle of his power and his grace. And my friends, I don't care how many other miracles you witness, that will always be the greatest one you see. That miracle where you went from Doubt, disbelief, blindness, lack of concern, apathy towards anything related to God, Christ, the Bible, the Christian life, and then all of a sudden it 
is everything. He is everything. And then he talks about gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think it's so much that we see the gifts operating in us. I think what he's getting at here is that we begin to realize that God is reaching, speaking, helping, healing to people around me that he is saved and filled with his spirit. I think of some of the wonderful interactions I had, particularly when I was first coming into the faith. So many remarkable things that people did and said, how they loved me and cared for me and, and seemed to be able to speak right into my heart, how they served me with such unimaginable joy and zeal and vigor. God used all of that. In fact, track the life of any believer. Listen to their testimony, how Christ became their Savior, and you will always find elements like these, right? And then right in the dead center and surrounding all of their story, you will find God speaking about Jesus through his word. And whether you're a believer or a believer adjacent, Jesus tells us to heed the warning. The writer of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. So let's get down to it. God didn't prepare this message in me this morning to speak to the air, but to speak to us, to you. I know that some of you are drifting away. You're in a time or a circumstance, maybe not even of your own making, or, or maybe it is. And you feel right now, and have for a while, like God is silent, or angry, or maybe you just feel like He's just not real. Go back to the gospel. Find Jesus in the gospels. Is he like that? No. Silent, angry, unreal. Is he like that? No. What do you find? You find Jesus and he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. You find a Jesus who talks about leaving the 99 sheep to go after the one that drifted away. He tells about a father who welcomes and restores the prodigal child. We hear Jesus, and he calls you friend, and he loves you. So I ask you, where are you going, huh? Where are you going? And some of you are drifting away because you have such anxiety and, and fearful concern and enormous unmanageable need in your life right now and your faith has been drained away and, and God is virtually imperceptible to you right now and you're drifting away and I urge you 
Go back to the gospel. Find Jesus in the gospels. Would he leave you like that? No. You find Jesus in the gospel and he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says, come to me and you will find rest for your soul. You go to find Jesus in the gospel, you find him healing the sick, comforting the mourner, and calming the raging sea. That's who you find. So where are you going? And others of you are drifting away for other reasons, too numerous to pick out and mention, any reason. And, and, and truth be told, you don't want to, but there you are, unmoored from your faith, unmoored and unlinked from Jesus. If Jesus is anything in your life right now, he's the ghost of Christian past. Go back to the gospel. Find Jesus in the gospels. Would he leave you like that? No. This is a Jesus who keeps coming back. He comes back from the dead. He raises the dead, and he will raise you from a comatose faith. Oh, yes, he will. And he does it for the joy set before him. He went to the cross, and because he went to the cross and then rose again, he will raise you up and fill you with that exact same joy. And then you know what he'll say to you? Come, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. So, where are you going? West Springs Church, God has spoken to us in these last days. He has spoken to us through his son, and we must pay the most careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away.